So if you take your scriptures and turn them to Revelation 22, I'm going to begin by reading at verse 8 and read all the way down through the end of the chapter. So John continues now to close out Revelation 22. And he writes these words, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is athirst Come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. In these moments, as we close out this mysterious book that you have nevertheless used to reveal to us not only that you are worthy of our worship, but as well, Lord, that you have ordained by your sovereign hand the events that should happen and should culminate in the end in the joyous reunion of you with your people you have redeemed. And so this moment, Lord, we come together to thank you and to praise you for that kindness that you have shown to us. And as we close this book out, I pray that we would be compelled not only to worship you, but to do exactly as John did at the close, to invite people to come. And we pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Well, here we are, the last verses of Revelation chapter 22. And the last verses of the entire revelation of Scripture, these verses, for me, serve both as a scary warning, but also serve as a precious promise and a wonderful exhortation. And that's essentially what I want us to examine this evening as we close out this book. We're looking at verses 10 down through verse 21, and of course, we can't get into all the minutia of everything in such a short period of time. So my intention is not to get into all the little details of the text, but to show you the highlights as we close out. Because really what John is doing is he closes his book, and as Jesus gives to him this revelation, he's giving to us an invitation. An invitation. And the invitation, quite simply, is to believe the words of Jesus and to invite people to come to him while they can. We have the chance to come to him while we can. And he says these words in verse 17, Who 
Whoever, this is the New King James Version, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. This invitation here is given to those who wish to be a part of this end time economy that God has established. Simply tonight, I want us to remember this exhortation that we not only are invited to come, but that we are called to invite others to come to this wonderful conclusion that awaits us in the future. In verse 10 and 11, we look at uh, kind of a little prefatory remark here, because it's somewhat of a conclusion of the previous few verses. And so I'll just mention them here in verse 10. The angel says to John, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. You'll recall, perhaps earlier in Revelation, that there is a scroll, a book, and it has seals on it. And when there is something that is sealed, you can't open it. This morning, on my desk, there is a gigantic box, sealed, filled with books that were for the teen Sunday school class. And unfortunately, I don't possess great strength, and I don't have a knife. So I take my key, and I try to open it. But I have to tell you, the packaging that they did was a fantastic job, and my, my key was struggling, as was my puny arms. But I did eventually get it open. The point I'm making is if something is sealed, and sealed to a great degree that you can't open it, it's incredibly frustrating. Imagine if John were to take everything that he sees in this revelation that Jesus gives to him, and God says, all right, you may not reveal that to anybody. Imagine what that might be like for him then, to walk around seeing his fellow humanity unaware completely of the things recorded in this book and the things that are talking about the future. I would imagine that would be a hard thing for him to bear. And there are times in the book of Revelation, and if, if you remember from Daniel, you'll remember there are times when God says to Daniel, you shall not write what you see. God says to John in the Revelation, you shall not write down certain things that you have seen. But all the way at the beginning of the book, it was intended to be understood and embraced. And so as John comes to the close, the angel says to him, not seal up these things so that nobody can see. But he says, do not seal it. Why? Why should he not seal it? Because these words were intended to be read and understood. Not perhaps to the greatest degree we possibly could. Certainly we don't know the mind of God. But we do know that these words were intended to be read and that those who hear and do them will be blessed. So God with, could withhold his blessing and say, do not, record these, or do not record these words so everyone can see. Seal up the book so nobody can read it. But instead, he says, God's intention is that you would make sure this book is spread far and wide so that people can not only read it, but do it and receive the blessing thereby. But verse 11, he makes this interesting statement. He says, he, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous. He who is holy, let him be holy. What is he trying to communicate? Why is this angel sent from God saying, let the person who is unjust remain unjust still? Isn't the whole point of the gospel that we're supposed to call out to people and tell them, repent? I think part of what is happening here that the angel is saying is that there are those who will just refuse to believe the words in the book. Who will see the justice of God as they read, and yet in their own deeds and actions remain unjust. Who will see the glorious, pure river of water of life and read those words of the description of the future for those who love God, and yet remain filthy in their actions and thoughts and conduct. I believe that, in a sense, it's a call of condemnation to those who refuse to yield. 
Because as we're about to see from verses 12 onward, this entire book is not intended just to be a a curiosity shop for the mind of Christians, where we're trying to mind map everything that God has in place. And of course, God has revealed the things that should happen in the future. But the point here that he's trying to draw is that there are people who are intending to take these words and to, to manipulate them in such a way that we will refuse to embrace the one who revealed them. We are called to yield and obey. That's ultimately what Revelation is calling for us to do. But there will be people who will ignore it. And the angel says, if they're going to ignore it, you can appeal and you can appeal, but they won't believe. And this bothers us, right? At least it bothers me. Is God just giving up on them? Shouldn't God give everybody a chance to repent? But I think... What's happening here as well is that God has just revealed to us just how deeply evil the heart of man is apart from Christ. Because over the course of the book of Revelation, as God unleashes judgment after judgment on sinful humanity, what is the response of the people? Do they see the judgment of God and they cry out, Oh Lord, forgive us! We have, we have been wrong. We should have yielded to you sooner. No. Over and over again, they shake their fists in the face of God, and at the display of his majesty and judgment, they still say to him, how dare you? Our wickedness is so deep that apart from the grace of God, we are of all people most miserable and doomed. And those who are unjust, God has every right to leave them in their wickedness, in their unjustness, in their filthiness, and judge them for it. But he calls to the faithful at the end of verse 11, he who is righteous, let him be righteous. Continue on. Be faithful. Embrace the words you see. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Essentially, The Lord is telling us those who refuse to yield will be judged. Those who continue to be faithful will be blessed. Continue to be faithful. And so verses 12 on, we see several things here that I believe are exhortations to us to be faithful. And the first one is the call for us to come. We must come. The call to come. Jesus reminds once again, I'm coming quickly. And guess what? My reward's coming with me. I'm not going to leave you alone. And I will give to everyone according to his work. Those who worked evil will be rewarded for their evil, the judgment of God. And those who worked righteousness in the spirit will receive the joy and felicity of the presence and pleasure and smile of God. And Jesus, again, reminds us that he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed, then, verse 14, are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. We already saw the tree of life. It's a symbol of the fact that we have eternal life that we've been longing for, that we're waiting for, that we can't wait for. I can't wait for it. Those who obey are the ones who will have the right to enter into that kingdom. But he he says, there are those of you who are still remaining on the outside because these people will not be allowed access to the tree of life. They will not be able to enter the gates of the city. And who are those people? People who are sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, whoever loves and practices a lie, none of these things will be permitted in the presence of God. And so he gives us not only this invitation to come, but he also gives to us this warning. Because if those who believe that their lives are fine, that God does not see or care, they are reminded by Jesus He does see, he does care, and there will be judgment for those who refuse to obey. So he gives this invitation to come in verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. 
The Spirit, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Who's the bride? That's an interesting question and one that is greatly debated. Because some people believe the bride is the reference to the new Jerusalem. Remember, you saw it coming down as, as a bride coming down from heaven, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's a possibility. But of course, also throughout Scripture, the bride is referred to as who? Us, Christians. We're referred to as the bride. And so perhaps what is, what is being described in verse 17 is not only the Spirit of God is calling us to come, but that he is calling all the people who will repent and believe the gospel through his bride, the church. We are all together calling out, come. And I frankly believe that it, it, is, it is a reference to, to us as Christians that we are called by our Savior to give this invitation into this new reality that we're looking forward to, to come and let him who hears say come. This here isn't just you listened with your ears. This here is you embraced it. You believed it. And so you say, I hear these words. I embrace these words, and I'm calling all people to come. Let him who thirsts come. This is one of the things that we have to embrace as Christians. The reality that while we do not know the secret thoughts of God, we do not know those whom he has called and redeemed to himself, but we are called indiscriminately to give out the message and let the Spirit do the work. And so we are simply called out as Christians to give the gospel. Cry out, come. And I just ask you this question, when was the last time you did that? When was the last time you invited somebody to come to Christ? Whether it be through your personal testimony, perhaps you could describe how you came to him. But when was the last time you actively took a part in sharing the message of the gospel and telling people to come? Because as John describes in verse 17, there are people who are thirsting for the truth. And unfortunately, that what they're going to find if they look anywhere else besides Scripture is a lie. It's a fabrication of Satan designed intentionally to deceive them and to bring them away from the message of the truth that they have. When was the last time you gave that message to somebody? Are you willing to invite somebody to come to Christ? He is the one who invited people to come, including us. You came because he called you. Let all who are weary and heavy laden come to me and I will give you rest for your souls. There could be no greater joy than to find that kind of rest. So we, there is the call to come. But there also is the warning of judgment. Verses 18 and 19. That John writes down his solemn testimony. I, test, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Anybody listening to what this book has to say, be warned. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. This solemn warning is scary to me. Because there are people who wish to add to the words of this book. And I say this book more than just Revelation. I think they wish to add to the scriptures themselves and to take away what God has given to us. Imagine if I were given a letter from Laura and she had written me a letter. She actually did write me some letters. She wrote me a letter and I opened it up and she's written in her, she has beautiful handwriting, she's written in her beautiful handwriting, this letter designed for me to read. And it's three pages long, and I've read the entire letter. The most meaningful thing about that letter is not only the time she took to write it, but the fact that she is the one who wrote it. And every word that she wrote is precious to me. A letter you may have received, I don't know if anybody writes letters anymore, but if you receive a letter... It would be precious to you because that person you care about took the time to write to you. But imagine I get a letter that's from Laura. But she wrote the letter and then she gave it to her sister and said, hey, why don't you write something too? But didn't tell me. 
So the entire time she's writing this letter, and then she's got her sister adding on to it. And now I've got not three page letter, but I've got a five page letter. And I open the letter and I read it, and all I see is that it's signed at the end, yours, Laura. Hugs and kisses. Well, the significance of that letter would not be quite as deep, probably, if I found out that it all wasn't written from her. The hugs and kisses at the end might not be as appealing to me, <laughs> considering her, her sister also wrote in it. Imagine to the greater degree, I'm arguing from the lesser to the greater here, imagine from the greater to degree, not only the letter, the book that has come from holy God, but the very words that contain the power of eternal life being altered by our hands. How important is it for us to see the Holy Scriptures and read them as a letter from God, not coming at them with hidden agendas? One of the things that I believe, and not everyone in this room may agree with me, and that's totally fine, is that the Scriptures are inspired by God in the original writings. If I want to know the words of God, I want to make sure that my English copy of that is going to be as close as possible to what Paul wrote, to what Daniel wrote, to what Moses wrote. I want it to be as close as possible. And if anybody is trying to twist what they originally wrote, I believe they're not just twisting the words of holy men of God, they're twisting the words of the Spirit of God. And so the copy of Scripture that I use must be that which conforms as closely as I possibly can to the words that God has written down. Because I don't care what somebody thinks God said. I want to care what God said. And I hope that you do as well. Because that's what we want. We care about what our God has said to us. So John offers to us a solemn warning. The words in this book may seem harsh. Nobody in this room, I believe, wants to see the death of the wicked. I don't. There's a sense in which I identify with them. I don't deserve the life that God has granted. I don't deserve the gospel. I don't deserve eternal life. I don't deserve seeing the face of God in the presence of God. So really, I identify more with sinful humanity. We all do, right? We're all humans. And when we see our fellow humans resist the gospel, resist the message of the cross, mock Jesus, mock Christianity, mock everything that God has written down in his word, it ought to not make us necessarily angry, although we should be ha having a righteous indignation at people who are blaspheming God, but it should also, I believe, give to us a sense of sorrow. Here's another human being made in the image of God, created for the very express purpose of magnifying him, and refusing to do so. I think it would be easy for someone to come to the book of Revelation and say, I don't like what I'm reading. I don't like fire coming down from heaven. I don't like seeing my fellow humans crying out, let the mountains and the rocks fall down on me, then see the hand of God. I don't like that. And I think most of us in this world know that, other than it being a swear word, none of us like to talk about hell or the judgment of God. In some ways, even the way we present the gospel can seem almost softened. Like, don't say anything about you're going to hell. But the reality is, is how can they not see the desperate nature of their sin apart from the holiness of God and the justness of his wrath upon it? So sometimes we naturally want to soften the message that God has given, right? Right? Would it be any surprise then that people would read John's revelation and say, wow, I don't think anybody's going to believe our message if they read that. But John says, I testify to you solemnly, do not change the words. Do not change the message. And I'm appealing to us that this warning be heeded by us as well. As much as we want to make the gospel as appealing as we can, and we don't want to drive people away unnecessarily, but we cannot, we cannot lessen the message. Because Paul says that message, as hard as it is to hear, is the power of God's salvation to those who believe. So we are given this call, and we are also given this warning. 
And finally, we're given an encouragement. In verses 20 and 21, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. This is how he closes out his book, The Words of Jesus. If you have a Bible that has the words of Jesus in red, it probably has that phrase in red. Surely I am coming quickly. Jesus has made a promise to come back. He promised his disciples that. And as they're standing, looking at their Savior, go into heaven and ascend to the right hand of the Father. And they say, now what? And the angels say, what are you standing, staring? Go and do what he told you to do. So they go and do it fully, probably expecting him to come back in their lifetime. And for the next 2,000 years, every generation as, as if they are people who believe the words of God and believe him at his word, they probably believed that their generation was the one too. And if we are optimists as Christians, I have to say we hopefully are thinking the same thing now. That Jesus might come any moment, even before this sermon is done. And if that were the case, then praise the Lord. He testifies that he's coming quickly, and the appeal that John makes there is even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. So we, invite, we are invited to come, and we invite others to come. We are warned that we are to keep the words intact, and we are encouraged to know that Jesus is coming quickly. And he closes out the book with this benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. And that is any... There's no other way to close out a message with these words than to echo the words of John, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all as we wait for him to come. Let's pray. Lord, our joyous hope is that the words we have read over the course of these two years in Revelation are true, that you are coming quickly. And we thank you that we have this invitation to come and that we are called to give that invitation to come. So I ask, if there is anybody in this room who has not embraced the gospel of Jesus, they would believe his own invitation. Let him who thirsts come. Draw sinners to yourself, Lord, through the power of your spirit. Lord, I also pray that you would help us to have a sobriety when we view your word, that we would view it with carefulness, longing to know not what people think of your word, but what your word actually says. And thank you for the encouragement that you are coming quickly. And we echo the words of John when he says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this hope that we have because of Christ, for we ask it in his name. Amen.